I'm Hal Humphreys. This is the PI Education Pursuit Magazine monthly webinar. It is September, coming up on October, which is quite possibly the best month of the year for so many reasons, not the least of which is it is my birthday month coming up. So I'll be celebrating my birthday the entire month of October. Um, how many times has this happened to you? Somebody finds out you're a private investigator and they say, oh, I'd make a great PI. <laughs> Some would, some wouldn't, but what kind of person does make a great investigator? Is it all about innate ability and personality traits or can good sleuthing be learned? Here to talk to us today about what makes a great detective is Ramesh Nyberg. He spent 27 years in Florida law enforcement, 22 of them as a homicide investigator. He's written articles on police issues for police and true crime publications and wrote a column called The Rap Sheet for the Miami Herald. After retiring from the force in 2006, he founded Nyberg Security and Investigations, a PI agency in Miami. Now he's got a new book out about this very topic, the 10 must-haves to be a great investigator, and a new podcast on investigations called Nothing But the Truth. He also wrote a fantastic article for Pursuit Magazine recently about the perils of doing surveillance at Disney World. Ramesh, welcome, sir. Thank you, Hal. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know I, I kind of breezed through that introduction, but you know, tell us kind of who you are, where you're from, what you do. I'm from Miami, grew up here in Miami, Florida. Um, and uh, before we get too far into it, I just want to say that that, that, that article you, that you referred to was more about the uh, lack of perils of doing an investigation at Disney, but it was a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, I grew up here, um, got into law enforcement at a very young age. Um, I was not from a law enforcement family, neither one of my folks uh, or even my grandparents were, were from law enforcement, um, it, unless you count my grandfather who was with the Swedish Royal Guard and would always tell me that every time I saw him and show me pictures. So that's kind of uh, cool though. But, but yeah, yeah. Uh, other than that, um, uh, there was no background or, or no influence whatsoever. This was something that kind of cropped up in my life uh, after my teen years. And um, so, yeah, I've, I've raised my family here and uh, stayed here and um, don't know if I'll stay my, for the, for the long haul, but I'm still here. Well, it's not a horrible place to be. Um, I'm I'm very much tickled to have you um, have you here with us today in this topic of what does it take to be a good private investigator or good investigator in general. Um, you know, Kim writes the, the the intros for me. I come in and make a couple of changes just so I can say them properly because sometimes I can't work my mouth around certain words the way she writes it. Um, but I mean, the second you tell someone at a party, at a cocktail party, whatever, they say, what do you do? And as I'm a private investigator, I mean, 99 times out of 100, somebody says, I'd be great at that. Right. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I don't think you would. Um, sometimes I think, yeah, you <clears throat> actually might. Um, but uh, the book is, it's an intriguing topic of what actually makes a good investigator. Let me ask you just from the top, can good sleuthing be taught? Yeah, it can. Um, I, I don't necessarily mean in a um, classroom environment. There are some things you can learn in a classroom environment. Uh, I think the best way to learn investigative techniques and gain investigative skills is with a mentor and, and to be working with someone who has that experience. That certainly was the case for me. Uh, when I got into law enforcement and when I went into homicide, um, it was a daunting place. It had um, it had its own mystique about it, and and it had its own kind of culture, and uh, rightfully so. I mean, it, there were the detectives there were held to a really high standard, right. and and so I learned most of what I know about investigations from senior detectives who trained me, and I followed them around. That is, um, that is one of the things that I think a lot of people just don't have the opportunity to do, especially if they're in the private sector and have never had any law enforcement. It's really hard to find a good mentor to kind of uh, bring you up to speed on how to do this work. Um, I, 
I do think that, you know, if you come from a law enforcement background, you think about investigations from the perspective of um, admissibility and chain of custody and evidence procedures and those kind of things. From the private investigation side, a lot of times that stuff is not quite so important. Um, but I think it's good for private investigators to know kind of the ins and outs of that stuff. Um, but yeah, I yeah, agree. I think, Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's totally fine. I think, um, you know, there are several organizations around the country uh, speaking to the mentor opportunity. Um, I know Fally and FAPI are both private investigator organizations there in Florida. And both of those organizations do a really good job of mentoring young investigators. And if you're an investigator anywhere in the country, you're going to be able to find an association of investigators in your area. Um, go to those meetings, meet those people, uh, show interest in them and ask them to mentor you. Um, a lot of people are more than happy to help out with that kind of stuff. Have you had an experience with that? I have, um, especially with some of the, uh, the younger detectives I've worked with and invest the private investigators I've worked with. Um, they've asked me lots of questions and that's really <clears throat> kind of how the book came about. Um, I think I, I, you know, not to sound uh, haughty or arrogant about what we did, but as I said, in Homicide, I was very, very fortunate to be around great detectives. And the title of my book in no way suggests that I am a great detective. Uh, <laughs> what it means is that I was around uh, great detectives and we had a great unit. And that's what was the important thing is we worked together. Um, but uh, absolutely, um, I, I saw... I don't want to call them deficiencies. They, they lacked certain things and it wasn't their fault because they had never been around that kind of uh, level of professionalism. So I helped them by writing little, I guess, little training manuals, like two or three pages on how to handle this kind of person, how to do an interview, how to make your surveillances better. And at one point I thought, you know, maybe I should write a little brochure and give it to them. And then it turned into, heck, why don't I just turn it into a damn book? <laughs> I love it. That's great. Um, in, in, in the, the process of, you know, getting out of law enforcement, uh, and deciding what to do next with your career. And you're obviously a very young man to be retired, but, um, Thank you how for was your, it? your bad guess on that. Because... <laughs> <laughs> how was it coming out of law enforcement and starting a private company? Did you have any struggles there? Um, struggles in terms of, I'll, I'll tell you what the, 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 I think the struggles that many people have, not just in private investigation work, but when they take a skill that they have or, or a, a knowledge base that they have and they decide, I'm going to go into business. Most of us aren't business people, right? And myself included. So, you know, I got a lot of help from people and, you know, the whole business side of things, marketing and bookkeeping and all those things, that's a, that's a totally different ball game if you want to be successful at having an agency and, you know, talk about mentoring, you need help on that side too. Um, so the challenges I think were to get the word out and luckily for me, and again, this is my good fortune to have worked with many, many uh, great, um, uh, not only investigators, but attorneys over the years. Yeah. And I'm talking about great prosecutors and great defense attorneys that I went up against on the witness stand who remembered me. And, um, and, and I've actually worked for a couple of them, the ones that were trying to tear my case apart on the witness stand. And, um, you know, there's a great professional respect there. Yeah. And um, so uh, I think that's the key is, is to network uh, more yeah. than anything. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the reason I pushed the PI organizations for, for investigators, like I came into the business from a completely disparate background. Um, and I've never been particularly good at the business side of things. I've always had work. Um, but going to conferences and meeting other investigators and meeting other people who have run a business. Um, and yeah. if you're coming out of law enforcement or the public <clears throat> sector, uh, where you've, you've had, um, you know, policies and procedures that were implemented for you and you got a paycheck and a retirement and all those things. When you're a private investigator, you don't have those things and you That's have right. to manage 
all of the business. Um, and you know, it's, it's helpful to talk to your peers and see how they're doing things. You know, Brian Willingham, who is, is a good friend of pursuit magazine and a good personal friend has, we have knocked things back and forth business wise over the years. And it's been really helpful to have, uh, someone help me get through those things. And I think for young investigators and, and mid career investigators that don't have law enforcement background, um, learning the skills of a private investigator, um, can be quickened if you avail yourself of those networking opportunities. Um, and I, you know, again, I push, if you get a chance and you're new to the business, or even if you've been doing this for a while, join one of your local organizations, um, to help yourself meet some other people and, and, and get that input. But also you might find yourself mentoring someone along the way. Yeah, no question. Um, and I've brought a couple of um, new investigators up from their CC, what we call here in Florida, the CC intern license. Right. Um, and, and brought them up to, you know, their C license. And some of them are just really outstanding, you know, and I love right. having them on my team. But, um, but for sure, the, the organizations are a big help too. I, I, I've enjoyed meeting people there. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's kind of get into the book. You've, you've broken the book down into, and Kim has talked about breaking down a kind of three broad categories. We're just going to kind of walk through this kind of chapter by chapter and talk about the 10 things that people need to be a good investigator. Um, the first chapter is, I think the title is Face Realities. Um, anyone choosing investigations, whether private or public, should be fully aware of the limitations and legal boundaries of the industry. Um, learn about the requirements to be a PI and don't go by what you've seen in Hollywood. Um, talk a little bit about that. I mean, I think that's really important. A lot of people are like, oh, I saw this on a movie. I actually talked to um, a couple of years ago, uh, a, a guy had retired from <clears throat> federal probation. Mm -hmm and had gotten a PI license and he was talking about trying to interview a witness. And he said, you know, I, I know where they get their haircut. Should I go in there and try to like, listen in? I'm like, no, 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 that's not what we do. <laughs> we right. have to be upfront and honest and, and, you know, those kind of things. We don't listen in, we don't sneak around. We don't sneak up on people so much. Um, but talk to me about the realities of either private or public, knowing the rules and knowing the parameters. Right. And, and, you know, there's no question that most people get their perceptions about the PI work from these Hollywood TVs and movies, just like they did when I was in police work. Most people have a lot of misunderstandings and misperceptions about police work and what's done and how it's done. Um, you know, to be to be honest, uh, most most uh, police procedural type shows would be mighty boring if if they went <clears throat> right by fact by fact right because there are times in law enforcement where things are very methodical and very not exciting uh and hopefully you get an exciting result but um but for sure in in private investigation it you know if you can avail yourself of again a mentor who can show you the reality of things and and of course as you're preparing for your your test, whatever state you're in to take your test and all that, you're going to see the material that will give you those boundaries, legal boundaries and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't, you know, the, the, um, the prototypical image is of this kind of inspector gadget looking guy with the trench coat and the, the hat sneaking around in the bushes and, uh, and, and, and also the idea of working on criminal cases. And as you know, our criminal cases are 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 the rarity. They're not the they're not the norm. They're they're the exception, uh, unless you happen to get hooked up with a law firm that that handles a lot of of criminal cases, um, and and even then it's it's you know hit or miss. So uh, you're going to be working mostly civil cases and family court cases and things like that. So understanding those things um, kind of avoids some. Uh, sticker shock, or if you want to call it that, once you get into business. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, when we talk about all right, so criminal cases, I know that that's the bulk of what I do. And I know a lot of people who do that because that's what I do, but you know, Brian Willingham does uh, mostly due diligence work. Scott Fulmer does mostly surveillance work. Um, you know, we've got friends around the country. It's to say I'm a private investigator. It's a broad 
yes. swath of things you could Absolutely. do. Um, you know, when we're talking about the rules and the parameters, if you're working on a criminal case and you're engaged by the attorney who's representing a defendant, the rules of discovery are really in your favor. If you're working on a civil case, the rules of discovery are not in your favor. And those are the kind of things that you need to think about if you're, if you're in this business. Like if you're doing civil work, pretty much anything you write and deliver to the attorney can be discovered and probably will be discovered. Um, so yeah, there's some, there's some ins and outs of the business that are weird. And I think, you know, I think Ramesh, you're absolutely right. Um, the best way to learn these things is, you know, study for the test, take the test. You're going to see kind of the black and white rules, but learn from your fellow investigators and the attorneys you work with. They're going, most of them are going to keep you in bounds because they, they want to play inside the rules. I know some attorneys will ask you to do things that you might not ought to do. Um, and there are ways to handle that. But, um, you know, the, the image of, of private investigators on television, I, I grew up watching Magnum PI and watching Rockford and, you know, I don't to this day own a lock pick set. <laughs> I'm not going to break into someone's apartment and go through and find, you know, the, the smoking gun. That's just not what I do. Yeah. Stay away from felonies. They're not, that's not good for you. Yeah. Um, and then from, from the criminal side um, of investigating criminal cases, I think it's really important to point out that if you're a private investigator, there's virtually no chance you're going to be hired by a prosecutor or a police office to help them out. Right. Um, if, yeah. if you're private investigator, they've got their own number one and they've got each jurisdiction has a little bitty nuances of the rules of evidence and that kind of stuff. So if you're a private investigator working in criminal cases, you're probably going to be working for the defense. No doubt. Yeah. Um, you right. know, we, you talked about working for some amazing prosecutors <clears throat> and some, some defender attorneys who uh, grilled you on the stand. I know a lot of people coming out of law enforcement have really bad heartburn about working the criminal defense side of things. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, that that's definitely, um, I guess, an internal struggle that you have to have some, from time to time. And I've done some cases. Um, I don't particularly like the idea of working against my former colleagues. Right. It's just it's just an uncomfortable situation. And so you have to weigh, you know, you have to weigh those things. Uh, case by case. Right. Um, I think uh, if you can appreciate what a defense attorney is trying to do, and you can discuss the case with them, obviously, beforehand, uh, and see if there are inequities that you can help with, um, then, you know, you make that choice. And, and then you can also use the philosophy, well, if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. Um, but <clears throat> I do, I do evaluate. Uh, if I take a defense case, I do evaluate it first. That's good. That's good. That's good process. I like that. Um, you know, facing the realities again, we all grew up watching television, reading novels, those kind of things, seeing the movies. Um, are there any television shows that you can think of that are close to accurate for PI work? Or, or you talk about police work, it, police yeah. procedurals, PI yeah, work, I mean, whatever. For funny, the, I'll, I'll answer for the PI stuff. I don't think there is. Yeah, I'm because, glad you, I'm glad you yeah, said that because yeah. I, I never people I surprise people all the time when they ask me. Um, I, I don't think I've ever seen an episode of Magnum PI. <laughs> um, it wasn't it Tom Selleck? Was it Selleck? Yeah. It, yeah. Okay, so that's all I know about Magnum PI right there. Yeah. Um, and Rockford Files and Jim, James Garner and all that stuff. I think I might have seen one or two of those years and years ago. Right. Um, I wasn't a big TV watcher. And I think that comes from, from my years in police work when, you know, when you're working 60, 70 hours in, in investigations, you come home, you don't want to see something about police work on TV. You just don't. Right. right. And most of them, <clears throat> excuse me, most of them, um, were very inaccurate and they were, yeah. you know, they were hokey if you want to use that word. Yeah. And, and they, um, they, they just, uh, it ruined it for me. Um, to this day, you know, I, my wife always kind of nudges me and says, you know, can't you just enjoy the movie and, you know, and not, not, not criticize it. So I've gotten better at that over the years. Okay. You know, uh, and now I'll just sit there and watch a crime drama and keep my mouth shut. But, um, yeah. but for sure, um, 
there, there's just a lot of, um, there's just a lot of misguiding information. But look, those movies and those shows are not meant to educate. They're meant to, to entertain. And, and that's Absolutely. what they're for. So. And at the end of the day, you know, <clears throat> prop, you, you alluded to this earlier, but proper investigative work can be some of the most mind numbingly boring stuff you've ever done. Um, a, a lot of the work is just like getting out knocking on the doors, talking to people, putting stuff That's together, right. gathering information, gathering information, gathering information. And a lot of times you're, you're deep, deep, deep into the process before an, a picture starts to form in your mind of what actually happened. So sure. it, it can be pretty boring. It can. But, and, and then to answer your question, I, I probably, I went down a rabbit hole and didn't answer the question. So, um, <laughs> I don't know if you remember the drama Hill Street Blues. Yeah. It was a very popular uh, police drama in the, what was that, the 80s, I guess. Uh, very, very well done. Very realistic for police okay. work. Uh, okay. uh, Homicide Baltimore, I think it was called, or Baltimore Homicide Life on the Street was also very, very good. Okay. Um, but after that, it's just, it kind of trails off. <laughs> There's not many. Yeah. Have you ever seen The Wire? Yes. I did see a couple episodes of The Wire. I thought it was very well done. Yeah, I th it was an interesting look at the kind of inner workings of a police department and the the, the uh, politics that goes on there. Well, let's okay. move on uh, and sure. get to the next thing. Um, I think we've kind of beat the dead horse enough about know what the parameters are. Don't go to television to learn how to be a PI. It's not the right thing to do. Um, find a mentor, those kind of things. Open mind. Investigation requires that you don't <clears throat> jump to conclusions. Things aren't always what they seem. Keep bias and prejudices away from the forefront of your work, which should instead be focusing on facts and imagining different scenarios. See if the set of facts you have fit those scenarios. Talk about opening your mind. Why is that an important skill for an investigator? Well, I think the danger that and you can you can come to, and, and again, we're as you said, private investigators are usually not in the business of figuring out things or solving things. We do have to solve certain situations from time to time and overcome some challenges, but we're not actually resolving a case most of the time. We're, like you said, gathering information mm -hmm. to support whatever our client needs or wants. Um, but, um, you know, the, the question of whether... Um, uh, Get me back on track. We're, we're talking about the... Um, Why is it important to keep your mind open and not, not go. go down a rosy path on, on investigations? Like my brain just did. So, uh, <laughs> right. So, yeah, I think you need, to, you, you need to keep an open mind so that you don't jump to conclusions and so that you don't especially prejudge people. Because I think that's a big one is when you're talking to people, uh, if you expect them to say a certain thing or say something a certain way, uh, you might be subconsciously misguiding or misdirecting the interview. And I'm big on interviews. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I don't want to jump ahead, but um, in interviewing skills and people skills um, are huge and, and not, uh, there's not enough of a spotlight on that, I think, in the PI industry. I think that's probably the most important part of the job, uh, especially for if you're doing anything other than straight surveillance work, that is probably the most important part of the job um, yeah. and, and honing those skills and keeping, you know, I've worked on divorce cases where husband thinks wife is cheating on him and you follow the wife and find out she's actually doing something for him or for the church or whatever. And like you, but it looks nefarious when you're out with the camera and you're expecting her to be cheating. You know, just avoid those things. Approach every case with an open mind. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about, let's move on to how to deal with clients. Um, and I'm not talking about from so much of a negotiation standpoint for how to like get more money out of them. Um, yeah. Skillfully discerning what their needs are so that you can identify the objectives and goals of your investigation. Part of this is helping them understand um, chapter one, which is what we can and cannot do. So talk a little bit about how to deal with clients. Yeah, I think uh, anyone that's been in the PI business for, for more than a year, perhaps, um, has been presented with some unrealistic or maybe even illegal things that a client wants them to do. And... Um, so I think part of our job is to educate them and to make them understand. And I think also, and this goes back again to interviewing skills, um, a detailed interview with your client 
is super important uh, uh, early on. Get as much information as you can. You don't want to be sitting on a surveillance and um, see another car, uh, you know, across the street, and you're going, holy, "Holy mackerel, that guy looks like he's on a surveillance too." And you call your client, and they go, "Oh yeah, my husband hired somebody too." You want to get this stuff, and that happened to me. You want to get this stuff out of the way uh, and understood early on. Right. And so, don't be afraid to ask a ton of questions for your client because you might help them understand something or answer something in their own mind that they didn't even think of. Yeah. And, you know, when the client, you know, it's, it's not at all unusual. It happens, especially with the general public. They say, Oh, well, can you, can you put this voice activated recorder in their bedroom and catch them? Like, can you say title three? <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, part of going back to chapter one, know the mm-hmm. rules, know the parameters, know what you can and cannot do, and then help your clients understand what is okay and what's not. For instance, if they say, hey, I need you to find out how much money is in his bank account, without his permission, you're not going to do that. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's move on to, to say yeah. again. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It's fine. Let's move on to research tools and resources. I know a lot of investigators love this topic, and I think it's a really important one. Um, There are one or two pay sources you cannot do without. Um, They provide swift access to public records and restrict data like license plate registration in some states. Um, There are a lot of free resources that you can access, uh, and many that most PIs (laughs) miss out on. Let's talk about some research tools and resources that you like and that you use. Yeah, and I don't want to make it sound like an advertisement for anybody, but I've I've consistently used TLO over the years. Uh, I know there's other ones out there that are just as robust and 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 just as fast. And you know, I've just become very familiar with it. Um, and that's not to say I couldn't change if you know somebody shows me something different. But but I think you you got to have that. It's definitely worth uh, whatever fees you're going to pay for those searches. Um, you know, when I look at what these, these things can do nowadays, I just, you know, man, if we would have had that back in the day, you know, the, the, the ta- uh, you know, vehicle license plate recognition and, and that sort of thing is just phenomenal. It yeah. really is. It's a, it's a tool that um, has helped uh, many times do some confirmation work for us. Sure. I mean, you found out that Billy's driven on the parkway and ended up at the mall down the way. And he's, there's been a license plate capture <laughs> along the way and you can kind of track where Billy's been. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Pretty yeah. amazing. And so that plus, you know, all the other uh, public uh, uh, public access and public records that are available to us for free, um, they're out there. And um, I, I interviewed somebody for my podcast recently that told me about how to get military records, which, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to do much, but that's another thing that, you know, you might not think about. So right. it's it's important to keep a checklist of, yeah. of what, th- what things you want to check out. You know, when you talk about public records and it's, this is, you know, my background is in, in kind of commercial due diligence for, from, from a valuation perspective, I'm a certified general real estate appraiser and I did commercial valuation for years, but I also grew up in a courthouse going through paper documents, trying to find things. And when I started the PI business, that was almost like a superpower because nobody knew how to go to the courthouse and look for documents. Um, So, and, and, and again, They're public record. They're available. Tax assessors information. Um, The number of times I've gone on TLO or IDI core and pulled an address and then go to Tarrant County appraisal district and type in the subject's name and find another address that didn't show up on TLO or IDI core. And that's where they live. I mean, right. if, if they own property, go to the tax assessor. There's a lot of available information out there for you. For sure. And, and also, I don't want to miss this point. When you go do a background check and you're getting criminal history or you're getting police records on someone, let's say you do a, a criminal history check and you don't find any, any criminal arrests. That doesn't mean their names are not on a police report somewhere. Go to your local police department. We used to do a thing called a, a victim subject check. That is, and, and almost all police uh, departments can do them for you. I want every single report that Jimmy Jones has shown up on as a witness, a victim, a subject, a reporter, and they can get it for you. And from that, you can tie in associates. You can learn a lot, an awful lot. 
And as a private investigator, so you go to TLO or IDI Corps, one of those paid databases, and you get a county history, that is where you go to get that information. You go right. county by county and check. If they don't have a criminal conviction and it doesn't show up or they haven't been arrested, um, doesn't mean they hadn't been in trouble with law in some form sure. or fashion. Yeah. Um, interesting. I love that. I, I just, this is one of my favorite things to talk about is what it takes to make a good investigator. Well, and um, you know, and, and once you get those records, Hal, I don't want to, you know, like go too far into this, but once you get those records, now you've pulled some reports that this subject has shown up on, right? And maybe he, maybe somebody made a complaint about him for whatever it is, and, and he wasn't arrested. And you get the names of the witnesses there. Now you can go one step further and contact those witnesses and do interviews on those witnesses. And I guarantee you, you're, you're going to knock the socks off of the attorney you're working for, if that's who your client is. Absolutely. And they, they, they don't think about those things a lot of times. They really don't. Um, I'm, again, thank you so much, Ramesh, for being here. And I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Ramesh Nyberg, is that right? That's, that's how you say it. Okay. Um, I'm Hal Humphreys. This is the PI Education monthly webinar for September. And we are tickled to have Ramesh here with us talking about what it takes to be a good private investigator. Um, I do have to take just a little bit of time to say um, Stephanie Mitchell and Kim Green, our office manager and executive editor uh, here at Pursuit Magazine and PI Education, have insisted that I tell you if you'd like to get 10% off of any course on PI education, you can use the code FALL21, FALL21, um, all one word, and it'll get you 10% off of any course you'd like to take inside of PI education. Again, I'm Hal Humphreys, and I'm joined today by Ramesh Nyberg from Miami, Florida. Um, long time law enforcement uh, career and now runs a, a PI agency down there in Miami. And we're talking about the 10 things that you have to have, the must haves to be a good investigator. Um, so let's talk about our cars. Um, and I'm going to introduce this topic a little bit differently than Kim uh, did. I'll read her, her, her intro. Your car should have and not have certain things. There are big cameras and tiny cameras on the market. And you should know what works best for you. I'm going to suggest if you're a private investigator and you're doing surveillance work, maybe just maybe skip the crown Vic with the array of antenna on the back of it. Um, let's talk about wheels and tech stuff. Right. Um, yeah. You don't want to look, uh, you don't want to look like a retired cop or, 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 or a current one, certainly. Um, right. So I'm not an automobile expert, but there's things I've learned over the years and things I've learned from doing police investigations and, you know, down here in Florida, it's very, very humid and very hot most of the year. So when you're sitting in a car, um, you're probably got the engine running. Mm -hmm. So get those running lights out, take those lamps out of there. Uh, if somebody's walking through a parking lot and they see a whole row of cars and there's just one with running lights on, they know somebody's sitting in that car. So, you know, make yourself uh, blend in and take away those things, right? So and then, of course, everybody knows about the tinted windows and each state, I suppose, has their own laws about that. Um, obviously, comply with the law uh, uh, every time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, as far as cameras, you know, um, I've, I've experimented with a couple of things. I have one of those mirror fitted cameras that works pretty well. Um, also, it also picks up audio very well if you need to do that. But um, mm -hmm. that's nice when you're driving. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't, it's not real, real visible. Somebody looking in the rearview mirror. So that's something you might want to have. So, you know, I'm not a techie guy. I'm not a big, a fan of, 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 of owning a whole lot of things. Right. Uh, if, if I have a case that has a specific need, I'll go seek it out. But, you know, some people spend way too much money on a bunch of stuff that they don't use very often. So, P you know, they um, gearheads, <clears throat> they just, and I kind of fall into that category. We like to have a lot of little toys and tools and bits and bobs. And cool. at the end of the day, they are cool. They're great. Um, you know, we, we, um, the last surveillance case I did, this is the camera that I used for the entire thing. Uh, and nobody suspects you with an sure. iPhone. Absolutely. It's a, it's a fantastic tool, but, um, you know, cars and kit and gear, um, the only thing I can say is, you know, with, without going into, um, specific 
suggestions for what you should have, whatever you decide to have. I know if you're doing surveillance work, it's probably good to have a handy cam of some kind a, a digital video recorder that has a really good optical zoom and, yep. and, um, uh, digital zoom on it. So you can get really good images, learn how to use it, learn how to use the date and time stamp. One of the things I found when, when you use the mirror mount cameras, like you're talking about, and you've got audio recording on there, you can actually talk your way through the surveillance sure, and use the radio. If you, if for instance, NPR is playing, you've got top of the hour, it's 830 on Bob Edwards that shows up on the audio that verifies you were there on that date at that time. And you can also read out license plate numbers and those kind of things. And right. it's on audio and then you can get that transcribed if you need to. Yeah. Hands free, um, very handy, you know? Yeah. And, and as far as the, the, the camcorder, I've had a Panasonic handheld, uh, for many, many years. And it is a trooper. It's just, you know, it's great and great zoom. So that's very helpful. I cannot remember the, the, the camera that my buddy, Jason Addis uses. He's out in Waco, Texas, a really smart young investigator does a good job. Um, but he's like, whatever handy cam you decide to use, know it, know it well, know how to use it, know where all the buttons are, be able to get it to him in the dark and that kind of business. Um, yeah. So just know how to use your gear. And along those lines, like you were talking about the running lights on cars. I rented a car in Texas week before last. Uh, and it's one of those where you, you can put the car in park and turn the lights off and the running lights stay on. You can't right. get them to go off. Um, right. So <laughs> my truck that I have, when I turn its lights off and the car's running, the lights will all go off, which is, is handy. So just know the number of times I've talked to investigators who don't even know if their running lights are on. Right. Um, so know the gear, know the tech, know the tools you're using, know them well. We've got a couple of questions um, from, from the crowd. Actually, uh, Darcy Ode Butkus says to say hi to you. She's from down around Davie, Florida. Okay. That's a little so north of where I am. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. then Angela B asks a question. This is actually a really good question. Um, any advice on getting juror information in criminal cases? Juror information. Um, unless you're working with an attorney who has the juror information, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I've never done that. I've never been asked to do that. Yeah. Um, that's, um, you know, that, that's, that's a touchy, that could be a very touchy subject depending on what state you're in. Sure. Uh, regarding, you know, regarding the laws about that. So <clears throat> I would defer to the attorney that's mm -hmm. asking you that information. And I'm assuming that, that, um, she is working with an attorney on that. Right. So. Um, so I've had a little bit of experience with this and, um, in States where you get the Venire list ahead of time, you've got the list, you've got a lot of times you have name, address, age, those kind of things from right. there, you can run those through TLO and find out, you know, political affiliation, yes. whether or not they have a handgun, criminal history, all those things. Um, you can also do social media research. Yes. A lot of jurors, if you got the name, if you got the list ahead of time, go on social media and see who they are, what they do. Um, so there are a lot of tools you can use, but once you get the list, um, I mean, I, I worked on a case in Texas years ago where we had, a juror list, a pool of about 150 people. And we broke it down into 25 per investigator. And I sent them out to investigators across the country and everybody was running TLOs. And we had the entire report back in 45 minutes with That's incredible. jurors together. Now, here's the thing. I still to this day don't know why the attorney wanted to do that because I don't know how you get through that much paper. Right. It, it becomes too much information at some point. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, gathering data on people, obviously there's no danger in that. I would stop short of, you know, of, of doing surveillances on, on jurors that, 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 no, would be, no, 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 that, no, that, no. that could get you in some real hot water. But, but yeah. again, the attorney you're working with should know, as you know, how you've done a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I would say, um, Angela, is if you're doing um, a criminal case and you've got an attorney that wants you to do some upfront research on jurors, it takes time. Uh, if you're able to bill for all of your time, which most of us aren't, but if you're able to bill for all of your time, I have in the past put together note cards on jurors 
um, and have their juror number up in one corner and their age in another corner, their name right across the middle, and then any notes that I need on them in, in the list. That way, if you've got a note card for, if you've got a jury pool of a hundred and you're going to get down to 12, um, you know, the cut line's probably going to be somewhere around, I don't know, 45, 50. Mm-hmm. So you, you, as they call people up to voir dire, you hand the, the lawyer, the card for that person. So they have an idea of, you know, who they are, what they do, all that kind of business. It can be very helpful. So right, sure, Ang- Angela, I hope that's, that's helpful to you. That's a great question. Um, let's see. All right. Now we're getting into the next two topics I think are probably going to be yours and my favorite topics. <laughs> uh, chapter six is understanding human behavior. And this is one of those things that I think we can teach people what gear to buy. We can teach people how to use TLO. We can teach people, you know, we can tell people to keep an open mind and, and tell them, Hey, the realities aren't Magnum PI or Rockford files. Understanding human behavior can be a little bit difficult to teach. Um, but I think the longer you live on this earth, the more understanding you have that kind of stuff. And the longer you do this kind of work, the more understanding you have. So something none of us can ever arrive at, or rather it's a lifelong journey, but recognizing patterns, human habits, and what is more likely for most people to do than not can reap big dividends. So let's talk about understanding human behavior. Number one, why is that so important? Well, if you're doing, for example, Hal, if you're doing a surveillance and um, you know, maybe, maybe you lost the person and none of us here have any ever lost anybody on a surveillance. Have we? No, sir. Never happens. So, you know, uh, you want to try and pick them back up. Um, you should know as much uh, as possible about that person. Um, if, if you don't know where they were going, it would help to know that, um, they like to have a, a bourbon at five o'clock on Friday nights, or, if they like to go to a cigar place or what have you, um, knowing their habits is, is essential. And, and this comes with doing that initial, uh, initial consultation with the client. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in a general sense, have kind of an understanding and look into yourself. What would I do? What do most human beings do? We're more alike than we are different most of the time. Right. And so if you're kind of in a quandary of where would, um, our target meet the mistress, for example, okay? In a typical cheating spouse case, where would they likely go? Um, and I had a case like this and it's, and it's expressed in that chapter. There, there's a couple of stories in there, but you know, the, quest, the question is, um, how do you find a needle in a haystack? And so you make the haystack smaller mm-hmm. by, by taking out parts that don't make sense. So just look in the areas of the haystack that make more sense yeah. and at least you'll get closer. Uh, and maybe even hit pay dirt. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> people um, are, 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 we're creatures of habit. We don't like to go very far to do things. If we're going to go to a grocery store, it's going to be near our house. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're going to cheat with our secret lover, it's probably going to be fairly near where people uh, live and work so that they can get back quickly. You know, and obviously there's exceptions to all this, but sure. for the most part, we, we go for the low hanging fruit and, and things like that are important to understand. Yeah. And, and you talked about the initial interview or consultation with your client. One of the things I always ask is what are their haunts? Where do they go? Do they, do they have a favorite bar? Like in Nashville, if a person goes to Brown's diner, I'm going to be able to follow them. <clears throat> those people that hang out in Brown's diner, that's the only place they go. Um, but people have habits, they have haunts, they have the place they like to go on Tuesday night to play darts or whatever it is. Get all of that information from your client because they're going to know where they go to, to bowl or to drink or to hang out with their buddies or whatever. Um, and if you, like you said, it's never happened to me, but if, and, and Ramesh just said it never happened to him, probably nobody on this Zoom conference has ever had it happen to them either. But if someone were to lose... Um, the subject during the surveillance, um, just having an idea of where they might go is it's a place to start. You're not just sitting there twiddling your thumbs. You're like, all right, well, on Tuesday nights, I used to go here Just start there. And, and, and you, you've got somewhere to start. 
And the other thing I think that's really important about this topic of understanding human behavior, one of the most useful things you can do to understand another person's behavior is research them and be prepared. And we're going to go back to that topic of be prepared. It's one of the most important things you can do as an investigator is know as much as you possibly can. And Hal, I I just want to make sure our listeners know that your cheek, your tongue and and my tongue were in, in, in the cheeks firmly planted when we were talking about, you know, not losing anybody because uh, spend enough time in this job and you will. It will. Oh, the, the number of times I've just, when you first start out in this business, the number of times you think you've been burned is way higher than it actually is. Also, the number of times you think, oh, I can follow that person. Man, if you're doing surveillance by yourself it in a car, it's really hard. It's hard. It's a lot of work. And you, you yeah. I've, I've been on six person surveillances where we had six separate cars and radios and the whole thing. And we still lost the person. Sure. I mean, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Yeah, especially if they've got their antenna up and they're, and they're expecting to be followed and you know, that. So anyway. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think chapter six, understanding human behavior segues almost perfectly into chapter seven, which is interviewing skills. It's an art. It's not something everybody knows how to do. It's something that some people will never quite figure out. Um, It's an indispensable skill because attorneys place a lot of value on investigators who can take professional sworn sworn statements from witnesses. I'm telling you, this is the, especially if you're doing civil litigation work or criminal investigations, this is the thing that can be a superpower if you're good at it. So, um, Ramesh, tell me, you know, when you know you're going to be doing some interviews, what is your first step? Well, the first step is to, just like we were talking about, find out as much as I can about the person. Um, don't ever interview a witness without doing a background on them. Right. Um, find out a little bit about them and, and, and that sort of thing, because the attorney that hires you, and I'm always using that as an example, um, they probably haven't done that yet. They're probably depending on you. And they're, they're, they may be surprised when you ask them, and this has happened to me, okay, you want me to go interview that person? You want me to take a sworn statement too? <clears throat> and they say, you can do that? You know, and that was, um, when I was in homicide, that was our bread and butter. Yeah. We took witness statements day in and day out. And we knew exactly how the prosecutors wanted those styled. Right. And so that translated into, you know, my PI work. And um, I I feel that that's a super important way to um, separate yourself from most of the population of PIs in your state. They usually have no experience or skills in that area at all. Right. Yeah. And and, in styling those things is literally talk to your attorney get a copy of how they've done them in the past and cookbook it. <clears throat> That's right. Um, it's really not that difficult. Um, now I know in Florida is a two party consent state. Is that right? That's That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So Tennessee is a one party consent state. Um, mm-hmm. Georgia is one party consent. Texas is <clears throat> one party consent. I like working in one party consent states because I either have a recorder in my pocket Um, or I'm using an iPad and have it recording while I'm doing interviews. And I do that for a couple of reasons. Um, Number one, it protects me. Um, They can't say that I threatened them or that I misrepresented myself, those kinds of things. I can prove that I didn't. It also, it also protects the witness. (coughs) The investigator can't go back and say, oh, they said so-and-so, or they can't impeach them falsely because it's on tape. You've got it recorded. Um, As far as, um, interview skills, you know, I, I've been asked, I can't remember how many times, but the first question is always for newer investigators is, well, you know, how, how do you just go up and knock on a door? It seems really intimidating. I, I get nervous and my, my mouth gets dry. I totally understand that it's practice. You do it over and over and over. The other thing is going back to what we said earlier, prepare know as much as you can about the person you're about to talk to yes. know as much about the case as you can possibly know and especially what they're going to be talking about about the case know everything that you can so that 
number one, for your own safety, if you know they have a history of violence or they're, they're gun toting or whatever, you can be ready to, you know, turn around and run quickly if you need to. Um, but if you know a good deal of information about the case, um, you'll be able to tell when they're saying something that is contrary to fact. Correct. They, they may not be lying to you, but it, it might just not be factual. Um, and the other thing is, and, and Ramesh, you tell me about this, because this is one of the things I've just kind of stumbled on recently. When I'm getting ready to interview a witness, the more time I spend researching their social media and their background and those kind of things, by the time I'm knocking on the door, somewhere inside me, I feel like I know them. And it's sure. less intimidating to knock on the door because I know, I'm, you know, I, I know what their nickname is. I know what everybody else calls them. I, I think that's a helpful thing to do. And it all goes back to prep, preparation. No question about it, Hal. It, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's crucial uh, because in homicide, and I keep going back to that's where I got my training. Sure. When we were dealing with suspects, for example, or witnesses, it really didn't matter. The more we knew about them and our case, which we should know inside and out, um, you'll find yourself, first of all, exuding kind of a subconscious confidence about things. Yes. And, and as you're speaking to them, that witness will, will sense that. And the way you ask questions, you'll, you'll feed just a little bit of information that you already know, and it's going to make it uh, more difficult for them to lie. Internally, they're going to be thinking, wow, this guy already knows this stuff. I'm not going to be able to lie to him. And you'll have, uh, on, on average, I think you'll have better success getting uh, as much truthful information as you can. Yeah. Because people will lie. They'll lie about their shoe size. I mean, there's times when they just, you know, why are you lying? And, and, and you have to be able to be ready for that. And when you're fully prepared, uh, you, you might be able to anticipate what kind of lies might come your way. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think is really important when you're interviewing someone, um, I like to always try to leave the door open for a second conversation. Now get as much as you can in that first conversation, because you may not get the second, you know, swing at the, at the, at the ball, but That's right. If you can leave the door open, I mean, I'm not an attorney. So when I get back, I'm like, oh, this sounds great. And the attorney's like, yeah, did you ask this? Did you ask this? No, I didn't. Um, but they're going to think of things in a different way. Leave the door open so that you can come back later and ask them further questions. Or a lot of times I'll just tell the witness, look, you know, attorney so-and-so might want to talk to you. What you've said is very helpful today. It helps me understand it. They may need to help you to have you help them understand it too. Um, and a lot of times they say, yeah, that's fine. Um, so leave the door open. No doubt about it. Um, it just reminded me of a case we had back back in the 80s. Uh, it was a murder case of an innocent businessman and robbery murder. And we spent a lot of time working on it. And, and one of the guys, we, the first guy we brought in, uh, took a while. I was talking to him and he confessed. And, you know, so we knew we had our first arrest right there. He gave us the names of the other two guys that were involved. And, you know, the temptation would be like, I got you. Yeah. So B, now I'm going to book you in and, you know, rot in hell and all that stuff. But what I did was maintain respect for him. And I thanked him for telling me the truth. The next day he called me from the jail and he goes, you want to know where the murder weapon is? I know where it is. So that, you know, that kind of thing, like you said, can pay big dividends if um, you, you just keep that, that relation on, on a good footing. It's always a good idea. Um, okay. So those, I think literally, I, I do believe that the last two chapters, human behavior and interview skills may be the two most important things that, that we can study on and learn as private investigators. But I know that we all as private investigators, and there are those who will say, Oh, I don't do you know domestic work. I don't do surveillance. Work. We've all done it. If you're in a private investigations business, you've, you've done it. Um, and it's just, part and parcel of the trade. Um, anyone can learn to hide and film someone, but there are some aspects to this practical street sense tactics that can make your surveillances more successful. Um, Ramesh, tell me what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, I think, um, I think it kind of ties back into chapter six with the human behavior. That's a big part of it. Um, your, your surveillance, you might start out with a fixed surveillance and it might end up being a mobile surveillance. So be prepared for that, uh, kind of be able to anticipate where things might go. Always have a plan B when, and, a, and maybe a plan C for things, because 
things very rarely go exactly the way you want them to go on a surveillance or an investigation in general. Right. Um, one of the things I always tell my young detectives is, look, when you go out on a surveillance, have cash with you. Um, you know, you may go into a situation where somebody goes into a bar and sits down or goes and orders a sandwich at a, at a coffee shop. And, and then all of a sudden they leave in a hurry and you're at the bar there trying to pay your thing with a credit card and, they, and they're out the door. So keep cash with you so that you can get in and out of establishments quickly. Uh, keep, if, if you have a, a rapid transit system, a light rail system like we have here in Miami, uh, get one of those cards so that you don't have to fumble around at a machine and buy a ticket. You know, be able to follow your target uh, quickly without losing them because of reasons like that. Right. But that, that would be one of the things I would suggest. Yeah, I love that. And there, you know, there's, um, so I know a lot of investigators want to get really good like crystal clear video of their subject. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter that much if it's crystal clear, if they're readily identifiable and I'm shooting through the side view mirror of the car, yep. that's totally fine. Just be sure. able to say it's going to be flipped backwards because I shot it through a mirror, but like anybody's going to get that. Um, so yeah, again, be prepared, do your research and have some plan B and C in your back pocket. Um, I, you know, I, I have done the thing where I end up at a bar and I'm trying to, to pay with a credit card and the person is gone before I get out the door. So that's, that's a great tip right there. Um, we've got one question here from Mark LaBelle. Any tips for someone entering the PI field from a totally different industry? I will be completing an eight month course of study from a four year university in Texas. Um, I would say like we talked about in the beginning, um, find a local PI organization and join it and, and get involved and meet some local private investigators. Uh, if you don't have an organization where you are, uh, go on the internet, look up private investigators and just call them. A lot of them are willing to talk to you. Absolutely. Um, I, I agree with you hundred percent, Hal. And you know, my, my experience with those organizations is that the, the more senior guys, the more veteran guys that have been doing this for a while, they're, they're very willing to help. So go to the meetings, you know, rub elbows with them, offer to take them to coffee and just pick their brains. You yeah. know, another thing I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't say this, um, Mark is, you know, check out pursuit magazine. <laughs> there you go. There's a wealth of information on pursuit magazine that is really, really useful and helpful for uh, people coming from other backgrounds. And, and, you know, just for the record, I said it earlier, I came from a completely disparate background. Um, it turns out the skill sets are similar, but I was not a private investigator to begin with. Um, so you can do it. Um, investigative systems and techniques. I'm going to, we're going to have to, we're getting like down to three minutes left here. Uh, Ramesh, so we'll get through the last two pretty quickly. Investigative systems and techniques, routines, processes are important. Um, if you find systems that work, use them consistently every time, and it will help you operate with more confidence. Here's the thing. I have developed a system for interviews that if I get one step of it wrong, there's a real good chance the interview is going to go wrong. So I do the same thing every time. And when I say the interview is going to grow, maybe I have a nice conversation. I get a lot of information, but Kim Green is a pilot. Um, and she used to say, when we go fly somewhere, she's like, the flight's not over till the plane's in the hangar. Yeah. The interview is not over until you've briefed the attorney and written the report about the interview and it's been memorialized. So have a system, have a process. Um, tell me real quick, Ramesh, what are, what are kind of some of the systems that you lean on and that you like to use? Yeah, I mean, one of the most basic that we learned in homicide, you know, you keep a lead sheet uh, and a lead sheet is, is a checklist. It's very simple. What's been done and what hasn't been done. Check them off as you do them. Don't think you're going to keep all that in your head. Uh, keep a separate uh, legal pad for each case. Don't start scribbling information on, on the same legal pad. You're going to get very confused when you start getting busy. Um, you know, yeah, you're going to end up with a stack of legal pads, but that's how you're going to be able to find the information much more quickly and not, not confuse yourself. Yeah. I love it. Um, all right. So I just got a note that said, go straight to persistence and attitude and sign off because we're right <laughs> okay. up against the end. Um, persistence and attitude, a positive winning mindset cannot be overemphasized. It's human nature to second guess ourselves and give into a feeling of failure. 
People you come in contact with can sense when you have a can-do attitude or not and can affect the extent to which they cooperate with you. Talk to me about that, Ramesh. Why is it so important? I'll I'll keep it quick. Thomas Edison being interviewed by a newspaper after he was trying to to try to make something work and it it apparently had failed a hundred times. So the newspaper reporter said, so so you failed 100 times? And he said, no, I successfully found 100 ways that don't work. (laughs) <laughs> and and so that's that's the attitude we have to have don't get you know don't get emotionally down by by things that don't work don't listen to people that tell you that 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 you're not going to solve the case you know just keep at it and and it, i'm telling you most of the te- detectives great detectives i worked with were were not people with phds or masters they were just people that knew how to put their their nose to the grindstone and do it i love it Ramesh, uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, check out Ramesh's recent story in Pursuit Magazine, A Walk in the Park, Investigations of the Magic Kingdom. And please go pick up a copy of his book, The Ten Must-Haves to Be a Great Investigator. And if you get a chance, tune into his podcast, Nothing But the Truth. Ramesh, um, where can folks find these things? Uh, well, the book is on Amazon, so that's going to be easy enough to find. It's a, a Kindle ebook and where you can order in paperback. And thank you for that plug. Yeah. Um, and, and the podcast is on most of the major podcasts, Spotify and Amazon music or okay. whatever else they have out there. Very good. Ramesh Nyberg. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this with us. I've enjoyed chatting with you and I hope to chat with you a lot more in the future. I thank am. You, Hal, yeah. Thank you. I'm thank Hal you Humphreys. Know. This is the, uh, live, the monthly webinar from pursuit magazine and PI education. We're so glad you joined us. Uh, we will catch you next time.